Today we have a topic uh, in pediatrics, which is supposedly a little difficult to understand and equally difficult to teach. So it's on ECG in pediatrics. Now ECG in most of the scenarios in children is usually normal. However, there are times where ECG could help us come out of a situation which is difficult on OPD practice and also in an ICU setting. Consider yourself sitting in an OPD and a child comes with chest pain. Now ECG is an integral part of differentiating whether the child does have an organic cause for chest pain as a part of the evaluation. Or versus you have a four month old child in the ICU and if you see a big heart and you see an ECG which is relatively normal, you know that most likely you are not dealing with a cardiac cause for a dilated cardiomyopathy like an abnormal coronary artery origin. So with that understanding, our today's class will focus on only the basic principles of ECG. Now let's see how much we can cover in the next one hour and if needed, we will continue this in the subsequent session. So we'll try to cover the basic principles of ECG and then move on to the normal waves and intervals of an ECG so that we understand when we have the ECG in our hands, how to pro proceed in understanding and reading the ECG. So the basic principles, we will start with the first understanding of what is an electrical field of the heart and then move on to two most important parts of ECG. One is the ECG leads which are put on the patient and second is the ECG paper which finally comes in our hand. So the electrocardiograph is a galvanometer that can detect or record electromagnetic potential. So as we can see here, the electrocardiograph is having a positive pole and a negative pole. And these paired electrodes together constitute a lead that is the electrocardiographic lead that can detect the electrical potential between the electrodes. So this is how the electrocardiograph is the basis of our ECG. And remember that this is an imaginary line. In practice, this line joins the electrodes and that is called the axis of that lead. The heart also is situated in the center of the electrical field. So this electrical field has the intensity of electricity which is maximum in the center and as it goes in the periphery, it reduces. So there is some sort of an electrical field where heart is situated and hence we can use the same principle of electrocardiograph in understanding what happens to the imaginary line between the two electrodes. Now the ECG leads can be placed anywhere surrounding the heart in a three dimensional relationship. But for practical purposes, we use two planes. One is the frontal plane. That is the plane. This plane is the frontal plane. That is the coronal plane. And second is the horizontal plane. That is the axial plane. So the ECG leads are arranged in such a way that we have frontal leads and then the axial leads. In the frontal plane, we have two types of leads. They are named as the standard leads and the unipolar leads. Now, how are these two different? We will see in the subsequent slide. Basically, standard leads have two ends, the positive and the negative, whereas the unipolar leads have a single end. And the horizontal plane, the axial leads have only the unipolar leads. And there are terminologies which are given to the frontal plane leads and to the axial plane leads. Now let's see what happens in the frontal plane. The frontal plane is the coronal plane and we try to put leads as far away as possible from the heart. And these points are selected in such a way that they are equidistant from the heart. So the standard leads, we use the upper limbs and left lower limb to connect the leads. Now here you can see that the lead one is considered to be having the positive electrode to the left upper arm and the negative electrode to the right upper arm. So this is how it goes positive, negative as a horizontal line. Lead two has the 
positive electrode in the left lower limb and the negative electrode in the right upper arm. Hence, you have a diagonally going down lead like this with a positive here and a negative here. Whereas lead 3 has the positive to left lower leg and a negative electrode to left upper arm. And hence, we have the lead 3 in diagonally fashion like this. So we have the lead 1, the lead 2 and the lead 3. These are the standard leads for the frontal plane. And you can see here they have two electrodes, the positive and the negative electrode. And this is what forms the Enthoven's triangle, which is, a, which is an equilateral triangle. So this is the frontal plane standard leads. Now, what are unipolar limb leads? Unipolar leads are also attached to the limbs and we have typically the right upper arm, the left upper arm and the left leg. However, here we can see that there is only one positive electrode here and the negative electrode is considered to be at zero potential. Second thing is they are all termed as V because they are specific for unipolar leads. And A is the word which is used for augmentation because these leads need to be augmented. Otherwise, they are having a weaker potential. So you can see here, this is an augmented unipolar lead for the right arm, augmented unipolar lead for the left arm, and augmented unipolar lead for the foot. These unipolar concept, we will also use it in the axial leads. Now, if I put the lead positive in the right upper arm, you can see here that the activity is directed towards the cavity of the heart because my right upper arm is here. Similarly, my left upper arm, you can see here that it's directed towards the enterolateral surface of the heart, predominantly the left ventricle. And the left foot is directed towards the inferior surface of the heart or the inferior surface of the left ventricle. So primary understanding is these unipolar lids have low electrical potential. They have only one positive electrode and they are directed either towards the cavity of the heart or the surface of the left ventricle. Now coming to the axial plane or the horizontal plane. Now you can imagine an actual plane going here where the unipolar leads are connected. So this is the actual section of the thoracic cavity where you can see the heart here. This is the sternum and this is the vertebral column. So in the horizontal plane, the leads are fixed in such a way that you start from the right side of the sternum where the V1. Again, remember the word V is the letter V is used for unipolar lead. So we have the V1, which is attached to the right part of the sternum at the fourth intercostal space. And then you put the V2 at the left fourth intercostal space. And then you come to V4, which is attached at fifth space at mid clavicular line. And then V3 is somewhere between V2 and V4. V5 is attached to the anterior axillary line at the level of fifth intercostal space. And V6 is at the mid axillary line at the fifth intercostal space. So if you see in this axial section, the V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. So this is where the arrangement stands. And V2 is exactly at perpendicular direction to V6. And if you really see the angle between each lead is going to be approximately 30 degrees. So V1 to V2, this line will form an angle of 30 degrees. So this is about the uni unipolar leads which are there in the axial plane or the horizontal plane. So just to summarize about the orientation of the leads. Now the leads, remember that this is going to have some implication when we are going to read the ECG at the end of it. So this is the frontal plane and this is the axial plane. 
which is across the axis of the body. Now, this frontal plane has six leads, lead one, lead two, and lead three. And then we have the three unipolar leads, AVR, AVL, and AVF. And then we have the V1 to V6 in the actual plane. So you can see here the lead two, lead three, and lead AVF, they are all directed towards the inferior surface of the heart. Lead one, which is here, and AVL is directed towards the superior lateral wall. The AVR is directed towards the cavity of the heart. V1 is directed towards the cavity. V1 to V4 is interoceptal wall and V5, V6 is lateral wall. But relatively, V1 to V4 is more V1 to V2 is more right ventricle and V3 to V6 is more left ventricle. Remember that all these leads are attached in such a way that you do not have a single lead to the posterior wall of the heart. Now, as we proceed in this picture, it might look a little confusing how V1, V2, V3 is directed, but it will be more clearer as we proceed further. Now, the second component was the ECG paper, which we have in our hands. Now, remember that ECG paper is going to have something which is called a small square and something which is called a big square. So here, for example, in this figure, you can see this is the big square and this is the small square. Each small square is one millimeter by one millimeter and each last large square is five millimeter by Five millimeter and every ECG you will see something like this. You will see the speed which is written here. This is the speed 25 millimeter per second and then this is the voltage. So the voltage is measured this way and the speed is measured this way and normally the speed is kept at 25 millimeter in a second. That means in one second, the paper is moving at that speed. You will cover up 25 millimeters in one second. Now, if my speed is 25 millimeters in one second, then how many squares you will have per second? All of you can actually use your chat box to reply. What do you think? If I have 25 millimeters in one second, then how many large squares am I finishing in one second? Anybody? Anybody can answer. Anybody? How many large squares will I finish in one second? You know that one large square is five millimeters. So how many large squares? Five large squares. Yes, that's right. And one large square will be per how many seconds then? Five large squares per second. So one large square is how many seconds? So it's going to be one fifth of a second. Anybody? One fifth of a second is going to be 0 0.2 seconds. So remember one large square is 0 0.2 seconds. Yes. So one small square will be how much seconds then? It's going to be one small square is going to be how much seconds? Yes. So it's one fifth of 0.2 or 0 0.04 seconds. So remember that the speed speed is 25 millimeters per second that is a routine speed you can increase the speed in situations where you want to delineate your intervals or waves in a better way or you can uh, consider the same speed most of the times so where you have to remember that one small square is 0 0.04 seconds and one big square is 0 0.2 seconds yes so now we move on to the voltage which is this axis now, routine ECGs you will see like this, which is called standardization. And a normal standardization is 10 millimeter is one millivolt. Again, here also, you can manipulate your voltage depending upon what you want to delineate. So if my one millivolt is 10 millimeters, this is how my standardization will look. So one millivolt is 
10 millimeters. So my one small square is how much millivolt? My one small square is how much millivolt? If this full 10 millimeter is one millivolt, my one small square is how many millivolts? It's going to be one tenth of one millivolts or it's 0.1 millivolts. So let's see here. Just a revision of what we spoke. One millimeter is 0.1 millivolts. One millimeter in this axis is 0 0.04 seconds. Five millimeter is 0 0.2 seconds. And here five millimeter is 0 0.5 millivolts. So these are the measurements which we would keep taking when we are measuring, for example, a QRS complex, etc. So now with this understanding, we use this speed or the distance which is uh, there based on the number of boxes to calculate the heart rate. And this will be taken in further classes where we are trying to understand how we measure the heart rate. So this was about the basic principles of ECG. Now we are moving on to the next step where we are trying to understand the normal waves and the intervals. So there are a couple of waves which are the P wave, the Q wave, the T waves and the QRS complex. And then we have the intervals and the segments, the PR interval, the QT interval and the ST segment. Before we go into the individual intervals, we will see two things. Modes of activation of the atria and the ventricle and the basic uh, deflections what is the principle of that now here you can see that this is the way the atria gets activated and this is the way the ventricle gets activated so both of them are the part of the heart electrical activation but the mode of activation is so different so here you can see how the atria gets activated it starts from one point and then the electrical activation spreads like this that means that you have the activation which is happening longitudinally and by contiguity. What does that mean? It means that the proximal part of the atria gets activated first and then this part and then this part. That means by the time the distal parts get activated, the activation of the proximal part is done. Now, in contrast to that, the ventricular activation, you can see here how it happens. This is the endocardial surface. This is the epicardial surface. And you can see the electrical activity, which is happening simultaneously. So the ventricular activation happens transversely from the endocardium to the epicardium. And the proximal, the middle and the distal part is having a synchronous state in contrast to the atria. And this explains why you can decide about a hypertrophy of a ventricle on ECG because the activation happens from the endocardium to the epicardium. But you will never be using the word atrial hypertrophy because your activation doesn't happen this way. So atrial thickness or hypertrophy you cannot express on ECG. But ventricular hypertrophy, you can express. The second thing is understanding how the deflections are happening. So for that, we need to understand that we have a positive and a negative electrode and the electromagnetic forces are directed towards the positive electrode, then you will have a positive deflection. And if they are directed towards the negative electrode, then you have a negative deflection. So the direction of the electromagnetic forces would decide whether your deflection will be above the baseline or below the baseline. Second thing is, though we have four chambers in the heart, in electrophysiological sense, the heart is two chambered, where atria is considered to be a single chamber and ventricles are considered to be another single chamber and generally the left ventricle is dominant in adults so 
whatever we are talking about the ventricles means more about the left ventricle. So this is how we would divide the atria as a single chamber, the ventricle as a second chamber, and we have certain letters to denote the activation. The atrial activation, we use the letter P. The ventricular activation is represented by QRS and the ventricular repolarization is represented by the T wave. The atrial repolarization is not recorded on the ECG. So let's see this normal PQRST complex where you have the P wave which represents the atrial activation, the QRS, the ventricular activation, and the T as ventricular repolarization. There is this delay at the AV node which is represented as the PQ segment. Now, before we go into individual waves, let's see how do we understand uh, the exact onset and offset of a particular duration or the wave. So here you can see the beginning of the P and the end of the P. This is the P wave and the beginning of the PQ segment will be from the end of the P to the beginning of the Q. So this is the PQ segment. This indicates the atrial depolarization and this indicates the delay at the AV node. Together the P wave and the PQ segment is what is the PR interval. That is the beginning of the P to the beginning of the Q. Now we come to the QRS complex, which is the beginning of the Q to the end of the S, which gives you the QRS duration. And after the S wave, you have the T wave. So the end of the S to the beginning of the T is the ST segment and the junction of the end of QRS to the beginning of ST is considered to be the J point. The T wave is the beginning of the T to the end of the T. And hence this QT interval is the beginning of Q to the end of T. So it includes the QRS complex, the ST and the T wave. So here you can see that we are using Q waves in lots of calculations of intervals and complexes. And hence remember that wherever you want to measure either the QRS duration or the QT interval or the PR interval, make sure that you have your Q wave, which is well defined. And which are the leads where you see the Q wave? We will see in the subsequent slides. Now we will start with our understanding of the P wave. So as we know, P wave is what indicates the atrial depolarization or the atrial activation. And it's the composite deflection of right and left atrial activation. We also understood that atria gets activated in a contiguous way. That means the right atrial activation happens first through the SA node and then you have the left atrial activation. And finally, both these waves contribute to the P wave. So you can see here the SA node starts and uh, sends the impulses to the right atrium. So this is the contribution of the right atrium and the left atrium starts with its activation somewhere in between when the right atrial activation is midway. And this is how you have the left atrial activation, which then completes the atrial activation. Together, it forms the P wave. So you can see here, it's a composite deflection of the right atrial and the left atrial activation. Together, you have a wave like this. The right atrial activation happens a little quicker, usually by 0.03 seconds. The left atrial activation happens a little longer, takes a little longer, usually by 0.06 seconds. And in the frontal plane, you can see here that the sinus node first sends an impulse inferiorly and towards the right for right atrial activation. And after that, the left atrial activation starts where you have the vector going inferiorly and towards the left. 
But remember, you will always calculate the net vector for electromagnetic forces. So you can see here the dominant vector for the atrial activation is downward and inferior. So the mean axis is inferior in towards the left. And you will remember, realize that lead 2 is directed downwards and towards the left. So, your P wave in the frontal plane is best seen in lead 2 and you have a maximum width that is the duration of P wave which is acceptable which is usually 0 0.10 seconds and the maximum amplitude is usually 2.5 millimeters and not exceeding 3 millimeters. So, your voltage is going to be measured in millimeters and your Duration is measured in seconds. So now let's see what happens in the actual plane. Now the way in frontal plane we have the vector direction in the actual plane. Remember this is the sternum. This is the vertebral column and your RA is the anterior atrium. The left atrium is the posterior atrium. Now in this the SA node first sends the impulses which are directed anteriorly and slightly to the left. And then for the left atrial activation, you have the impulses directed posteriorly and towards the left. So you will see a wave which is directed anteriorly first and then goes posteriorly. Posteriorly means it will, it will be below the baseline. So for example, in lead one, you see the waves coming first front. That means you have a line which is going up over the baseline. And after that, the forces are going posteriorly. And hence, you have a wave which is negative below the baseline. So a normal P wave in lead one, V1 is going to be diphasic. It has two phases, a small positive and a little more bigger negative wave. Lead V1. It is okay to see two components, the initial and the terminal components. It's not abnormal to have a diphasic P wave in V1. And again, there is a limit to which you can accept a normal duration, which is usually 0.08 seconds. And the terminal deflection should not exceed more than 0.03 seconds and one millimeter in depth. So these are the normal measurements of P wave. And we will use that to understand an abnormal P wave. So remember that the SA node and the AV node both are situated in the right atrium, but the sinus impulse reaches the AV node much after the atrial activation is completed. So that is something which is interesting that the sinus node reaches the AV node in 0.03 seconds after it has left the sinus node before the atrial activation is completed. Now, the common morphologies of P wave. P wave normally is like this. So you can have an upright P wave. Can anybody say what is this P wave? How will you describe this P wave? You can enter your answers in the chat box. Enter your answers in the chat box so that you start thinking, just describe this morphology of P wave. If you will call this as upright P wave, how will you call this P wave? Anybody? This is an upright P wave. So this is an inverted P wave. How will you describe this P wave? Yes, yes, it's inverted. Inverted P wave. How will you describe this P wave? We just used that terminology in the previous slide. How will you describe this P wave, which we normally see? Yes, so it's a diphasic P wave. How will you describe this P wave? It is upright, but there is something here. So this P wave is a bifid 
or a notched P wave. And the last one is easy. How will you describe this P wave? It's a peak P wave. Yes, that's right. And usually the P wave which is seen in lead two is upright or it is smooth and rounded. Now, with this understanding, can we think about what abnormalities you need to see in the P wave? Either you can have an abnormal number, shape or axis of the P wave or you have an abnormal amplitude or duration. So can anyone say more than what amplitude of P wave we will consider abnormal? This is specially for right atrial enlargement. So we will include the lead two. How many, more than how many, sorry, more than how much amplitude would you consider it abnormal to indicate a right atrial enlargement? So what amplitude did we decide was acceptable? We decided that an amplitude of usually 2.5. So anything more than 3 millimeters, we will consider it as right atrial enlargement yes and the p wave duration of more than how much seconds we will consider it normal see for the left atrial enlargement we will specifically use usually lead v2 or v1 so more than how much duration will you consider abnormal you have different little difference in the values which we will use it for children and infants so we saw that a duration of maximum 0.8 in V2 or 0.11 in lead 2 is considered normal. So anything which is more than 0.10 or 0.08 seconds in infants would indicate left atrial enlargement. Now let's see when can we have abnormal number. For example, you have more than one P wave or you have an abnormal shape of P wave. The the way the P wave should be, it is not like that or it's changing in morphology or your P wave axis, the direction in which the P wave is going is abnormal. All these things indicate that my rhythm is not normal. It's not a sinus P wave. So what all can you think of when you have these changes in the P wave? It usually can happen if my rhythm is not sinus like nodal rhythm where I will not have a P preceding QRS or it can be an atrial tachycardia where I have my P wave morphology changing or it can be an atopic atrial pacemaker where my P wave is not from the sinus but it's from some other focus. It could be from one foci focus or it could be from multiple foci. So these are the things which can happen wrong with the P wave. I hope there are no questions. I want all of you to be clear about the understanding. It's okay if we cannot finish the, all the intervals in one session. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask now or at the end of the session. Now, with this understanding, we will go to the interval which is associated with P wave. And all of you know that interval is the PR interval. So the PR interval starts from the beginning of P to the beginning of Q. So the beginning of Q is the QRS complex and hence we define the PR interval as the time required for the P wave that's the atrial depolarization and the delay at the AV node that is the PQ segment. So the PR interval is the P wave plus the PQ segment and the characteristic of PR interval is that that Older the person as the age increases and slower the heart rate, longer is the PR interval. So the PR interval changes with the age. Older the person, longer is the PR interval. And also as the heart rate slows down for bradycardia, you have longer PR interval. I hope you can uh, understand this. So the duration of PR interval, there is a specific duration which is acceptable for different ages. 
In a younger age, 0.08 seconds is acceptable, whereas in adolescence, 0.12 seconds is acceptable. So a PR interval more than 0.12 seconds is considered abnormal in older children. So what all abnormalities can we have in PR interval? One is that you can have a prolonged PR interval, which is also defined as a first degree hand block, or you can have a short PR interval, or you can have a variable PR interval. So any thoughts, when can you have a prolonged PR interval? The PR interval can be prolonged in situations where I have first degree heart block. For example, it can happen where I have a congenital heart disease like an atrial septal defect or sometimes in Epstein's. I can have it related to drugs or electrolyte effect. Hyperkalemia and digitalis toxicity typically produces a prolonged PR interval. A short PR, that means I have a hurried transmission of impulse from the atria to the ventricles and that delay through the AV node doesn't happen. And this typically happens when I have an accessory pathway. Two typical accessory pathways producing syndromes are the WPW and the long uh, genon levine syndrome, or it can happen in a glycogen storage disorder like a Pompe's disease. And variable PR, that means sometimes I have a longer, sometimes I have a shorter, can happen when I have a wandering atrial pacemaker or it can happen in type 2 heart blocks typically in venki back phenomena where my pr interval initially is shorter and then it lengthens 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 till i miss a ventricular beat so these are the situations where i have a variable pr interval now we come down to the understanding of qrs complex this is a completely different understanding compared to the P wave because it denotes the activation of the ventricles. Now, as we understood before, the ventricular activation happens simultaneously and we have the forces going from the endocardium to the myocardium at multiple levels simultaneously. So multiple vectors are going on everywhere. Now, first, the initial vector happens in the interventricular septum. And in interventricular septum also, you have multiple vectors happening in different directions. So you can see here, you have a vector which is going from right to left. You have a vector going from left to right. But remember, your left ventricle is the dominant ve ventricle generally. And hence, you have a dominant vector. See, at all points, we will see what is the final dominant vector. So if I calculate my small final dominant vector, it is from left to right. So I have my initial vector, which is from left to right in the interventricular septum. And then this is followed by the vectors which are simultaneously working in the free walls. My RV free wall has a vector from left to right and my LV free wall has a vector from right to left. So my net vector is going to be from right to left because my LV is dominant. So now let's see on an ECG, how do I understand? Now we have to take into consideration the actual plane because the actual plane gives me an understanding of right to left better. So here if I see my lead V1, which is present here. The initial vector is from left to right. So it is towards V1. So I have a positive deflection. And the terminal deflection happens from right to left. So I have a negative deflection because it goes away from V1. So I have a negative deflection. As compared to V1, if I see V6, V6 is located towards the left. My initial vector is from left to right. That means it's away from V6. So I have a negative deflection. And the terminal QRS is towards V6 because it's right to left. And hence I have a positive deflection. So you can see here, 
my lead V1, I have a small R and a dominant S. Whereas in V6, I have a small Q and a dominant R. Now, how do I decide whether I name this as Q? So that terminology, how to define, we will discuss about that. But before we go there, remember that I have somewhere in between V1 to V6, a transition zone. Transition zone means I have an equivocal R and a S, both of which are same sized. And that is called the transition zone around V3 to V4. This is normally present in all normal ECGs and it's usually at V3 or V4. So this is transition zone. So as you know here, my V1, remember that normally this ECG is an adult ECG where my V1 is going to be predominantly negative. So I have this R small S bigger pattern and my V6 is going to have a small Q and a dominant R. So a dominant positive deflection. So you have a progressive increase in the R wave and a progressive reduction in the S wave as I go from V1 to V6. And you have the transition zone around V3 to V4. However, remember that this is not what happens when the child is small. So at first one month, I have a complete reversal of RS progression. That means I have a dominant R wave in V1 and a dominant S in V6. And this is called complete reversal. Between one month and three years of age, I might have a partial reversal. If I have a problem with my RS progression, it could happen if my ventricles are hypertrophied or if I have a bundle branch block or if I don't have an interventricular septum or I have conduction disturbances. So this is what is RS progression and how do I quantify my RS progression? My RS progression is quantified by what is termed as R by S ratio. My R by S ratio as we understand in an adult is less than one or it's small in V1 and it's more than one in V6. But in a newborn, it is going to be bigger than one in V1 and smaller than one in V6. And RS ratio is the only measurement in ECG which is not affected by the calibration factor because it is a ratio. Now with this understanding, can we move on to the nomenclature? I hope you are all clear and you're all with me what we are understanding. I hope you're all getting it. Uh, I have a feeling because at 9.15 we will do the QRS and then we will take the further uh, slides in the later class. But the QRS component will try to understand to our best. So this is how the QRS complex is. And remember the first initial negative deflection you will term it as the Q wave. The first positive deflection is the R wave. The second negative deflection after the R wave is the S wave. Now, if I have another positive deflection after the S, I will term it as the R dash. If I have another negative deflection after the R dash, I will term it as S dash. What if I have only a negative deflection, then I'll term it as QS. And remember in all these, I will use the capital letters for a major deflection. And if I have a minor deflection, which is less than half the amplitude, then I will term it as a small lowercase letters. The QRS duration is usually well acceptable based on the age and it ranges from 0 to 0 0.05 seconds to 0 to 0, 0 0.08 seconds. However, the amplitude is very variable. It can range from 5 to 30 millimeters and there are factors which can affect the amplitude of QRS complexes. 
Sometimes on ECG, you will see various complexes. You don't know whether this is abnormal or not. So you need to understand that basically the force which is generated by the myocardium decides the QRS complex. But also if I have a child who is thin, then I have a larger deflection. So the body built affects the deflection. Also, the distance of the sensing electrode from the ventricle. For example, if it's a precordial lead, I have put leads on the chest. My QRS and T deflections are going to be much more exaggerated compared to what I see in the limb leads. And finally, the axis of the QRS also affects the amplitude of QRS. So the end of it, if I want to think in terms of abnormality, I will see that my myocardium could generate or my axis could change the amplitude of QRS. Now, there is a terminology which is defined as the ventricular activation time. So what is ventricular activation time? Remember in QRS, by the time I reach the peak of R, my most of the ventricular activation has happened. That means my LV muscle has significantly got depolarized. And my ventricular activation is time is from the beginning of the QRS to the apex of the R. Now in V1, I have my QRS like this, small R. So this is the ventricular activation time. Whereas in V6, I have a Q and then a R. So my ventricular activation time is a little longer. So remember in an adult, your V6 will have your ventricular activation time acceptable up to 0.04 seconds. Whereas in V1, it's acceptable up to 0.02 seconds. There is also a terminology called intrinsic deflection. So what is intrinsic deflection? Sorry, intrinsic deflection is the change from that positive R to the baseline. So this is called intrinsic deflection. As we go further, we might use this ventricular activation time, but in practice, we do not use this concept too much nowadays. Now, I want all of you to tell me what morphology is this? The first one, can you name it? Can you name this morphology? The first one, as you know, the first negative wave is the Q wave. Based on that understanding, you need to define this. How will you write this? complex s you need to be careful about the small letter the big letter anyone the first one how will you write this anybody you can write your answers in the chat box, please. Yes. So the first one is Q R. Would you tell it as small s because this is considered to be half of the normal acceptable. So you will say Q capital R small s. Yes. Now can we define this? How will you write this Q R S complex? The second one. Yes, so this is R and S, both of which are equal amplitude. I would say I wouldn't use small r as here. This is capital R, capital S. Now coming to the third one, how will you write this QRS complex? There is a positive deflection and then there is another positive deflection. This is small and this is big. Yes. So remember this is R and then second R whenever it comes, you will put a dash here. So it is R, R dash and this is small and this is capital. Yes, you will not put dash in the first R. The second R or the second S will get a dash. That means it's a repeat R or a S. Now we can come down here. How will you write this? QR, that's right. It's a small Q and a big R. Coming to the next one, 
how, how will we write here? Remember that this is the first deflection is a positive deflection. So this is small r capital S. Yes, that's right. Now, how will we write this? This is similar to this. I know it's a little confusing, so I'll give up. It's a notched R. See the difference. This is R, R dash. This is notched R. Coming down to this, it has a single negative wave. So how will we define this as? S wave. I, I can understand the confusion, but you remember the previous slide. I said that if you have a single negative, you will term this as a QS because the Q and the S seem to be fused in this. <laughs> okay, so this one, the last second is a positive, negative, and a positive. Can we try this? A positive, a negative, and a bigger positive. So it's yes. Can you, do you want to term this as a dash one because it's come second time? Yes. So it's R, S, R dash. And the last one, you can go systematically. The first is negative, then a small positive, then again negative, and again positive. Yes, so you have this Q, R, S. Very good. So we have a very wonderful interactive uh, audience today. So let's see here. How will you define an abnormal QRS? So you can have a duration which is abnormal or you can have an amplitude which is abnormal. So how do you define the duration which is abnormal? We just went through this two slides before. Duration varies with age. So you will have a little bigger duration in adults and a little smaller in infants. Can anyone say more than how many seconds? You would say 0 0.06 seconds. That's right. So it's 0 0.6 seconds in children, which is normal. So 0 0.08 seconds more than that, I will consider this as abnormal. And in adults, I will accept a little bigger duration, more than 0.10 seconds to be abnormal. When my duration is prolonged, it's more to do with I have my conduction system, which is taking a longer time. So it can happen in bundle branch blocks or it can happen with my accessory pathway or it can happen if I have a pacemaker more with temporary pacemakers. If I have an amplitude which is abnormal, what can it be? It can be a larger deflection or it can be a smaller deflection. Now, larger deflection, as we told, the variation is so huge. So it's very difficult for me to give you a cutoff. But small deflections, anything less than five millimeters in the limb leads. Remember, my limb leads is going to have a little different number compared to precordial because as we saw, the precordial leads, you seem to have an exaggerated amplitude. So anything less than 5 millimeters in limb leads, I define it as low voltage. So when do I see large deflections? Large deflections generally is going to be a reflection of myocardial hypertrophy. So if my ventricle is hypertrophic, I will have larger deflections. And when do I have low voltage QRS complexes? Can you please type your answers in the chat box? Low voltage QRS complexes, when do I find that? It can happen if I have an extra covering. Yes, myocarditis, pericardial effusion, sometimes in hypothyroidism also. So that's the use of understanding low voltage complexes. Now, we will go into the Q wave. We still have 10 minutes, not 10 minutes. 
I think we have only five minutes. I think Q wave we will take it in the next session because it's a very important understanding. Q wave we will take it in the next session. I think we will keep the next five minutes for any questions. You want me to go back to any slide? We can do that. Any questions? Please, please feel free to ask. Any questions? Anybody? You can type in the chat box if you have any doubts. Remember that this session is important for us to proceed further. If there are doubts here, it's going to be difficult for us later on. Any questions? Amrita, if there are no questions, would you uh, want to end the session now? And we will continue with the next half in the next session. We will see if we can replace this, this topic. Uh, initially, we were thinking of doing arrhythmias next week, but I think it's important for us to finish off this basic understanding. So we'll continue in the next week. Yes, okay, I'm getting a question. Is you have newborn cutoff for all parameters, same as infants so um, i would say that so far whatever we have seen in terms of the p wave and the qrs yes but you will see in the next session that there is a lot of difference in terms of defining especially the right ventricular hypertrophy and the axis in the newborn compared to an infant so there are a few differences and we will see it in the next session but today whatever we discussed is the same for a newborn. Okay, thank you so much, all of you. Thank you so much and you all have a wonderful day. See you next week. Thank you, Amrita. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sejal, for the wonderful session and thank you all the particip participants for joining. Have a good day. I, okay. I think we can wind up now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Bye. Okay. Thank you so much.